Well, good morning. Thanks for coming in. We're going to go ahead and get started. And uh, I've got a bench full of stuff here that we got to clean up and some other details to take care of. Um, today, we're going to start on the teeth on the brake and uh, some other things. Before I do that, I kind of want to clear off the bench, give you an idea of the tools we're going to use today. We're going to use a Lincoln uh, arc welding helmet. This is a single shade. It's a 10. It's not one that electronically changes. As you strike the arc, some helmets, not this helmet. As you strike the arc, it darkens the lens. Really nice for high production work. Um, maybe a little bit more difficult for maintenance work. And for this, I just got a shade 10 solid, low maintenance, no battery, that kind of thing. So that's the, the welding helmet that we're going to be using. Um, I wanted to talk to you about grinding wheels. In the video the other day, you saw me using this. I was cleaning the shaft. I was cleaning the shaft of the brake uh, assembly and I noticed some sparks. What would sparks tell you? Sparks would tell you we're actually removing just a little bit of metal. This is the exact same wheel that I used on the hood of the 2021 to get a feel for how this worked. This is interesting material. <laughs> It's not like a grinding wheel. It's almost like a sponge, but it's, it's fairly hard. Um, not to be confused with a flap disc. A lot of people like a flap disc for uh, finish grinding, putting a radius on something or taking burrs off of maybe something that you had torched. So we're gonna try this again on there to remove that paint. I think that's gonna work well. Other things that you can put on a handheld grinder. Here's a cutoff wheel. Very, very thin, used for slicing. A couple different kinds of cutoff wheel. And of course, a cup brush. May end up using this, uh, you know, on some of the points up there when we're taking the paint off. So let's set these aside. We're not going to use these right away. Um, I did want to tell you, in the comments, somebody said something that I thought was funny. Uh, after one of the last videos, they said, don't saddle a dead horse. Don't saddle a dead horse. I read it and I laughed. I thought, what's he trying to tell me? That I'm um, talking about something over and over or too many times? Then I got it. We had talked about cable clamps. This is a cable clamp used for joining cable or putting a loop in the end of one. This is made up of the U-bolt, the nuts that tighten it down. This is called the saddle. So now you're maybe thinking what I'm thinking. What he meant was, and he's absolutely right, when you put together a cable assembly like this, what are the names of these parts of the cable? This is the live end because this is the dead end. If somebody tells you uh, you're, what you're working on is a dead end, well, this is a dead end. It goes nowhere. This is the live end. This is the dead end. When you put together an assembly and want to uh, clamp it. Now this is the wrong size clamp, but if you did this maneuver right here, you are saddling a dead horse. This is the dead end, and hence the funny term, dead horse. But it's a memory peg for you to remember how the clamp goes. The clamp goes, and I might be able to turn that, maybe not. Um, the clamp goes like this. You put the saddle on the live end and then tighten it down. That's what you want. Then you would run that down. Now this U-bolt might slightly indent the cable, which is fine because it's gonna help prohibit it from sliding through. But you want the saddle on the live end, never saddle a dead horse. Okay, hot beverage today. I hit the wassail pretty hard this time of year. It's a great cold weather beverage. It's in a Sheets cup. Sheets is a kind of upscale, upscale truck stop. I, was, I stopped at one the other day for a cup of coffee. I was looking at some rail that's still in the ground, still on the ground. It's disconnected from the railroad, so it's going to be sold, and uh, we're trying to buy it. If we buy it, I'm going to need your help pulling it up. It's probably 150 yards and it's got a switch in it which is the exact switch we need to add another uh, track or a passing track 
So that's why I was looking at that. That's why I have a sheets cup. We also have got two cans of Bolt lubricant. I'm going to talk to you about that. Let me kind of tidy up here a little bit and we'll go on in the next phase. Well, I'll bet many of you recognize what this is and yet some may need a clue or two. This is a railroad tool that's used by the brakeman and he does this uh, as a safety item. This item right here is what is now used, recommended, and maybe in some places required to tighten the handbrake. You hook that in the hand wheel and go round and round and round, and you can snug that wheel down with this. Um, this shape right here is because you can open the coupler up with it. You no longer want to put your hand in the coupler. Many people lost hands and, and arms doing that. Hook that coupler jaw. You can pull the coupler open. You can move the whole coupler. You can push the coupler. This little opening right here, I'm not sure about. I'm thinking maybe you could bend a big cotter pin with that if you had to. If you saw a cotter pin that was sliding out of a safety appliance or something, hit that cotter pin, roll it so it won't come out. Handy tool. It's probably also good if you're walking along the tracks and a, a dog comes out and uh, is intimidating you. Say, come on. Well, today's history lesson begins when I was looking at the rod that came down through the floor, through the compartment, into the battery box, and how s small the diameter was of the rod that you're winding the chain around. And I began thinking about that and how brakes have changed, and it dawned on me, this is a lot like the old brake shaft that had the round handle on top of a railroad car. Let's get back to fixing the brakes. We'll add to the history later. Well, the other day I, I ran this nut off of here and I thought I'm going to knock that bolt out. That bolt is kind of a key that's holding this together. And I struck that on the end. Now that's basically bad practice. You, you really don't want to hit something on the end of the threads, but if it works, you look like a genius. If you hit that and that pops right out the other side, then you, you, know, you take it and you set it aside and nobody questions it. But if the bolt doesn't move, everybody looks at you like, well, you just boogered up the end of the threads there. So it was pretty tight. So what I'm going to do is put on a little bit of bolt looser. Now I've got two kinds sitting here, liquid wrench. Um, I've also got some PV blaster around here, which I really like, and WD-40. Now, why wouldn't I use WD-40 on this? Well, it, it doesn't smell bad enough. WD-40 actually has got kind of a pleasing scent to it. We might talk about that a little bit. But this right here, this stuff stinks. And PV blaster stinks. And the ingredient that works on a stuck bolt stinks. Oh yeah, you can see it going down in there already. Um, if I go inside the house and I've got PB Blaster on, Mrs. ETR will say, you sure are ruggedly handsome, but you stink. Because PB Blaster really has got a strong smell to it. And again, that's what works. The problem with WD-40 is um, it doesn't smell as bad and it doesn't work as good. Now there are cases where I would use WD-40. One is on a fan. That's right, a household electric fan that's gotten noisy, um, where the shaft goes into the motor, tip that up and hit just a dot of that in there. The fan will quiet down and run just great. Uh, a seat belt where when you plug in, it doesn't latch immediately. You don't want the smell of knocker loose in your car. So uh, this would be much better for that. Also, if somebody has a drawer that doesn't, maybe the little rollers on it aren't as smooth. You don't want to take knocker loose in there and spray that down. Take WD-40 with the nozzle, hit that just a little bit. So what I found out is the smell of WD-40 to people that don't fix anything is a good smell. So if you have knocker loose on you, you stink. But if you have WD-40 on you, to people that can't fix anything, it's an amazing, they love it. It's, it I think it excites them. So if you uh, have WD-40 on you, you smell like somebody that can fix something. The WD stands for water displacement. 
A lot of people don't know that. And I think it was maybe the 40th formula they tried for water displacement. So it's not only water displacement, maybe in an electrical connection, but in your armpits as well, antiperspirant. I'm using this microphone and I found that I was really talking too loud. So part of this video might be uncomfortable to listen to. I'm trying people. I'm, I'm gonna get it right in the end. Okay, to deal with this broken off, to deal with this really tight bolt, I've gotten a bigger punch and a bigger hammer. Let's see what happens now. Son of a gun. Wow. It might be moving just a little bit. Well, it's going to ruin the bolt. <laughs> Dad, gone. Well, we may have to go to heat. We may have to go to heat. Whew. Yeah, it's moving. I have uh, ruined the bolt now, so that's off the table, saving the bolt. So we've got the liquid wrench soaking down in there. It's been in there a little bit. Now what we're going to do, we're going to hit the top of that. Boy, that is still tight. That is still really tight. Plan B. made a nice sound right at the end, but... Yeah, I got underneath it just a little bit. Wow. I think what happened was the hole wasn't drilled straight through the gear and the shaft and somebody drove 
the bolt in there years ago. Well, I apologize for the blacksmithing you just had to watch, but that bolt was so tight. Um, what I ended up doing was really mushrooming it really bad, but I got it to move. So uh, we're going to cut the end of this off with the grinder. Then we'll use this punch right here, which will go down in and we'll drive it out the bottom. If you want to see it move, watch right there and I'll tap on the top. You should be able to see it come out the bottom. Yeah, see the difference? Let's try that one more time. We'll watch the bottom and I'll tap on the top. Yep, it's moving now. Stand by and we'll grind it off. Well, this thing has fought us long enough. Let's uh, go ahead and drive it on out of there. You know, sometimes things go easy, sometimes they don't. And uh, this time it fought us a little bit, but we're going to get it. Get the view right. I should be able to use the smaller hammer. I've got liquid wrench soaking down in there. So let's get back to the history lesson. So what the 2021 uses, the brake rod, the brake shaft that goes down through the floor is called a stem winder. Stem winder is vertical. 
wraps the chain around the bottom. Well, I got thinking that is a lot like when the brakeman rode on the top of the cars and cranked the hand wheel that stuck up above the car. And it took a lot of effort. You really had to crank on that. And that was even after the, there was air brakes, guys still ran along in the tops of the cars. The brakeman cranked that down. Well, that eventually got replaced by what was called a gear or power handbrake, which is what you see today on cars and locomotives. They at first were up high where the guy could still reach them from the catwalk, but slowly they came down to where you could reach it from the ground. And in fact, today, um, they don't even want you stepping up on anything to crank it. You crank it with that tool that I showed you earlier. So there is no more running on the top of cars. Uh, that happened in 1966. Roof running boards uh, in 1974 were targeted for removal. And by the early 80s, it was outlawed and I believe illegal to do that, to have uh, walkways on the top of the car. So that's a little bit of the history. I've thrown in some pictures. Um, the 2021 uses that same system, but of course it is no longer on rail cars. The one thing I didn't insert there was that even after they didn't run along the tops and crank the handbrakes down, they did have air brakes, but they still needed to throw the relief valve, the retaining valve. So they would run along the tops, reach down over the edge and throw that valve for, and that was for when they were coming downhill. So there's a little bit of history on setting the handbrake. Uh, I think I've got a couple more details for you. Uh, big announcement later this week. Thank you all. I really appreciate it. So I wanted to show you how the park brake worked on this. This air cylinder has got air in it, so it's extended. But also, when you wind that park brake that I showed you, it pulls on this chain. Here's where the, here's where the shaft comes through. It just winds that chain around it. It's not very sophisticated. It pulls the chain and holds this linkage, which holds the brake shoe against the wheel. So as you wind down on that park brake up there, it pulls the shoe against the wheel. 